I hope you can read lips. Okay, we want to get into God's Word this morning, and I trust that you have your Bibles together and ready as we, we get into God's Word. Now, I want to start a new series for the month of January, and I have entitled it Servanthood. Servanthood. And this morning's message in the series, I have entitled, Take Up Your Mop and Follow Me. Take up your mop and follow me. And I mean no disrespect to the verse of God's word that says, take up your cross and follow me. But you will understand as we go along why I have chosen that title And I hope it sticks within your mind. Take up your mop and follow me. So turn to the book of Mark chapter 10. Um, Mike read it for us. Thank you for for reading it. Keep your Bibles open at that passage. And we will make our way through it this morning. You see, I thought it would be a great way to continue our start of 2022. Can you believe it? By spending time this January... On the aspect of being a servant. Of being a servant. Now there are not many books written on being a servant. You can search. You will find a few. But in comparison with so many other books that have been written by pastors and theologians and so on. You won't find many on being a servant, on servanthood. There are not many experts on being a servant, if any. There are plenty of experts in theology. There are plenty of experts in doctrine, in preaching, in teaching. There are plenty of experts in apologetics, defending the faith. There are plenty of sermons on so many topics. But what about being a servant? What about being a servant? What about serving? What about servanthood? You see, many people want to be the boss. And I'm not criticizing being a boss. Many people want to be in charge. Many want the perks of being the boss. Mention the word servant and people disappear. What is a servant? What is a servant? Let me give you the dictionary meaning of the word servant. Someone privately employed to provide domestic services like a maid someone publicly employed to perform services for the government. You see, people have over the years put a negative and bad connotation on servants. People tend to shy away from wanting to become a servant, from wanting to do the work that servants do in our modern day and age. When you study scripture and you go back in time, you will discover that the word slave was used. Now, we will get to that word sometime this month as we want to put it in perspective. Chuck Swindle wrote a book about servanthood. It is called Improving Your Serve. He wrote this book because it was actually from a number of sermons that he preached and he wrote this book. In the introduction and first chapter of this book, he said that when he approached to write the whole, to write about the whole question of servanthood, he was very negative about it. He didn't want to do it. And this is what he said. I didn't want to do it. I did not want to study it. It didn't seem very interesting to me. 
The whole idea of being a servant sounded negative. In fact, to me, when I thought of the word servant, I thought of roots, African slaves, and migrant workers who aren't paid very much and who are abused. In fact, when I thought of the word servant, I thought of a human meal. End quote. That was his thoughts. Those of you who don't know him, was a well-known pastor, teacher, theologian, author. And that was his conclusion about his research on trying to figure out what is a servant. And he thought it was just dumb, stupid, animal meat. Now the Bible has a great deal to say about the subject. Believe it or not. The Bible has got an absolute great deal to say about the subject of servant of servanthood and you will find unlike many many other subjects throughout the word of god you would find servant slave servant wood is an underlying theme throughout the word of god old and new testament now i am in the book of well, let me rephrase that I am reading through the Bible in 60 days. 60 days. That's give or take. Two months. Just over two months. And um, it is what we call power reading. So we get to it. So I know there are many different ways of doing it. And many of you have done it over a year, two years and so forth. So I, as I was reading again, my mind was refreshed and reminded of what was happening in the book of Genesis. And you will note the great impact the servant had on why we are here today. Did you know that? If you go back to the book Genesis and you read the account and the story of Joseph and how Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. And you will follow the life of Joseph and you will see the rise of Joseph as a servant to the point that the very same brothers that sold him came and bowed down before their brother who was a servant. And so let us not misrepresent the word servant. Let us not think servant is something awful, something bad, something evil, something that we should not aspire to. This year, I want to challenge us, and I include myself in it, that we will become servants, servants of God. Now, we're going to look at what that means over the coming weeks. Let me just point out just two facts. As I said to you, the Bible speaks a lot about servant. The first thing I want to mention to you, servant was Paul's favorite title for himself. Did you know that? The Apostle Paul often wrote, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Now, in almost all his letters, he used the word servant when he introduces himself. Not Paul the big shot, not Paul the apostle, not Paul the chosen one by God, but Paul the servant of God. You see, and I have done it myself, especially when I started studying theology at Bible college, when you study the life of Paul, and it's always about how great the Apostle Paul was in his understanding of Scripture, of how great Paul's knowledge was of God, of how great Paul's philosophical approach was in the world. And so the Apostle Paul has become one of the most loved apostles of all ages. But often we forget that that great man that God used counted himself and saw himself as a servant. Oh, wow. Jesus Christ himself presented to us the model and the ultimate servant. You see, when Jesus came to the earth, 
He came in the form of a servant. Beautiful passage in Philippians chapter 2, which is also known in theology. In Gnosis passage, the self-emptying of himself as he left heaven to become a servant. Who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. What's made himself nothing means? It means taking the very nature of a servant. The definition of being made nothing is to become a servant. Being made in human likeness. That was Jesus. You see, Christmas, not only the birth of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, it is the birth of God's servant. Our Christmas decorations are still and I think it is beautiful that it's still up because it is a reminder, and I've said this for the last few weeks, that for us as believers, Christmas should not stop. Amen? Christmas should not stop. Because we do not celebrate an event. We do not celebrate a day, 25th of December. But we celebrate a person. And this morning, we want to celebrate a servant. Jesus Christ. So I tell myself, if Jesus became a servant, who am I? If Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, can I remind you, the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord, He is God. If He became a servant, who am I? I am absolutely nothing. Just because I preach the word of God week in and week out from this podium doesn't mean I'm something. Just because I'm the minister in this church doesn't mean I'm something. I'm reminded, not this morning, but as I was preparing this message, I was reminded that you are nothing without Christ. In Luke, Chapter 22, let me create the scenario for you. It is Thursday night in the upper room. Jesus and his disciples have just celebrated the Lord's Supper. The shadow of the cross hangs over the room. In just a few moments, Jesus will be betrayed, arrested, tried taken. The road to the cross will be open. That's the scenario in Luke chapter 22 in the upper room. Now listen. What do you think that they were thinking about in the upper room? As Jesus was with his disciples, what was going through their minds at such a beautiful moment, such a holy moment? Such a desperate moment. Jesus telling his friends, his disciples, I'm going to go in a moment. I'm going to suffer in a moment. In a moment, my life, I'm going to lay it down for you and the whole world. What was going through their minds? Luke chapter 22 verse 24 tells us. Also, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. There in the upper room with the Son of God, and they have just had the Lord's Supper, they have just received from God His final words as it were, he was about to be crucified. The salvation of the world is about to be accomplished. And they were arguing about who would be the greatest. Completely missed the point. Now let me come to the aid and defense of the disciples. They did not get what this moment was about. 
they did not understand what God was teaching them. But let me fast forward. In the end, the disciples did get it. Their lives were changed. They all became servants of the Lord. They gave it all. God used them to write the New Testament. Many parts of it. But at that very moment, they were concerned about who of us are going to be the greatest when you are gone. Now I want you to go to Mark chapter 10, 35 to 45. And we want to look here now about what it means to take up your mop and follow me. As I was preparing this message, and thinking through it, there are many symbols for various things in life, right? For doctors, there's a specific symbol, a dagger with a snake around it. It's a red cross at times. And so there's many symbols for various things that you can identify with. What is the symbol for servant? What is the symbol for servant? Do we have a symbol for servant? And you will find that there's no symbol for being a servant. Most probably because servants don't announce that they are in the house. Servants don't proclaim, I am here to serve. Servants tend to just get on and serve. And that is part of the challenge for us this year. Will we become servants of God? And I am in no way saying that you are not serving God, because it's between you and God. So if you look at verse 35 to 37, here we come of Mark chapter 10. We see James and John, these two guys, requested positions of status. They requested positions of status from God. So never mind everything that Jesus said. They wanted to know who's going to be the greatest. Who's going to sit where in your kingdom? And so here you see, let one sit on the right and let one sit on the left. Now if you study carefully, you will realize that the place... At that time, the place of honor was the seat on the right. The seat on the right. The place of second honor is the place on the left. And that's why when you go back to Genesis, to see how Jacob and Joseph, and I think it was Joseph who was going to ask his father before he died to bless his two sons. And Joseph, in his mind, had his eldest on the right and his youngest on the left as he came to his father to bless them, knowing that the one on the right should be blessed. And you know what the father did? Swapped his hands around and blessed the younger. But the point here is, James and John, wanted to know which of the two of them is going to sit on the right and who was going to sit on the left. It says here, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Wow. It, it is a phenomenal picture of what Jesus just told them he was going to do and go through. And here they said, we want, just say yes. Anything that we're about to ask you we want you to do it. We want you to do it for us. Speaking about missing the point. You see, this was a continual topic of conversation among the disciples. You will find it in the other Gospels. They constantly spoke about it amongst themselves. And they constantly harassed Jesus about who was going to be the greatest. James and John feel confident that they will be the greatest. Never mind the other disciples. These two guys felt that they are going to be the greatest. There's an arrogance about them. As they asked Jesus to confirm their opinion. By appointing them to these two high positions. Now 
this is the reply of Jesus. And you come to verse 38 and 34 and 41. Jesus' re Jesus's reply was, you guys need to think in terms of sacrifice, not self-glory. Self-denial, not self-promotion. Now listen carefully. Here we are talking about the way God does things, not the world. The way God does things in Christian lives, the way God does things in the church, not the way the world does it. There's a difference, and he's going to speak about that in a moment. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? That's, so we asked them that. Listen to what they said. They said, we are able. So here's another arrogant confidence. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it is for those for whom it is prepared. Now, let me point something out. In popular Greek usage, the vocabulary of baptism, so when it comes to referring to the cup that I drink, Jesus was talking about an overwhelming disaster. He was talking about danger. He was talking about suffering. He was talking about pain. So he, he asked them, in essence, are you willing to go through the dangers that I have gone through, I'm about to go through? Are you willing to suffer the way I'm about to? Are you willing to give your life the way I'm about to? They missed that point too because they said yes. And you would know when Jesus went to the cross, could you find any of the disciples anywhere near the cross? Who did you find at the foot of the cross? Women. Women. Yes, John was far off. But in essence, they all fled. So here Jesus says, you have no idea what you're asking. And they said, yes, we do. Yes, we do. You see, James and John still worked under the carnal ideas regarding the kingdom of God. They were still thinking about an earthly kingdom. They had no idea what it would take to be great in God's kingdom. You see, as it turned out, James and John later on in their lives, did take the cup. They did go through suffering. They did go through pain for the Lord. At the time, in the upper room, when they said it, they did not understand it. But later on in their lives, they experienced it. They went through it. James was the first apostle to be martyred. You'll find that in the book of Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. So James was the first apostle to be martyred. Uh, now, according to tradition, John was also going through these difficulties. He was never martyred, but reliable sources tell us that he, John, survived an attempted murder on his life. And we believe he was immersed in a vat of boiling oil. He did escape by the grace of God, according to historical records. So, James and John went through it in the end, but at the time they did not understand. So when he says, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink, perhaps uh, Jesus said this with a big smile, and James and John thought, right, we are the two that have been chosen, but they missed the point. And that's why the others, when they heard, they were upset, and the two missed the point. 
Now I want to come to the verse or the section that really explains what it means to be a servant and servanthood. So there's, there we have this in the upper room. Verse 42 to 45. Jesus describes true greatness. So Jesus called all of them to himself and he said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it will not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. There you go. That's what Jesus tells us. True greatness is not seen the way the world sees true greatness. So it's been done before. You ask people, name me ten of the most influential people in the world or in your country. And often they go to presidents, prime ministers, businessmen who are rich and successful, powerful. Jesus says, those people, they lord it over people. They abuse people. They abuse their power, their authority that they have. And he says, that's not the way we do it. He says, true greatness is not measured by the success of life. True greatness is not measured by the position in life. True greatness is not measured by the power in life. True greatness is not measured by the wealth of life. But true greatness is measured by how low you can go. Now I'm saying things that many people will get upset about and there might be some in the church that disagree with it. But I always remind anyone that wants to become a leader in a church, whether deacon, elder, pastor, minister, whatever leader you want to become, you don't step up into leadership. You step down into leadership. In actual fact, if you go and study the meaning of the word diakonos, deacon, you will discover what it says. Serve. You see, irrespective of who you are outside in terms of your work, your position, your status, economic status, social status, Irrespective of that, now listen carefully here, irrespective of that, that does not determine you being a servant. Your life in Christ determines you being a servant. Whatever position you have outside, you can still be a servant. Just because you are a boss doesn't mean you cannot serve. Just because you have a job, and you are serving others in their homes doesn't make you a servant in the eyes of God because there's an internal attitude that is important to have in order to be characterized as a true servant of God. Church, does not operate like the world. Believers do not operate like the world. That is what Jesus is saying. here. So whoever desires to become great among you, be a servant. Remember what he says about children? 
suffer the little children to come unto me, for to such is what? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not like the pastor. Children, quickly stand up where you are. Quickly stand on the bench. Don't worry. Stand. I want you to stand on the bench. Don't worry. All the children, young and old. If you're under 18, you're a child, stand on the bench. Come on. If you're under 18, you're a child, stand on the bench. If you're too tall, don't worry. Come on, children, stand up. Stand up. Don't, don't be afraid. I want all the adults to look around. Come on, Daniel, stand on the bench. You don't get this chance every day to stand on the bench. Normally, parents shout us. Parents look around. The Word of God says, don't stop any one of these little ones to come unto me. Because these are the ones we need to look at, for such is the kingdom of God. What you see around in this building this morning, children that are pure, because children say it like it is, amen? They think purely. A time will come where the devil will tempt them to not. So let's give our children a hand, shall we? Amen? Right, guys, you can sit down. You can sit down. Jesus says, if you want to be great, become a servant. And you know how he qualifies it? Jesus does not only say it, but he showed it. He showed it to them. He tells them, and he showed them. Now, what did he say? He said, the Son of Man, verse 45, let me get it here. Uh, For even the Son of Man did not come to, ser to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, listen, what is significant about this verse? I'll tell you. Jesus, remember I, I, I read to you, Philippians chapter 2, the kenosis passage, the self-emptying of Christ. I'm going to throw some big words at you so you can be a bit more challenged. The incarnation of Christ. Fancy word of saying the becoming a man. We celebrated that a couple of weeks ago. The birth of Christ. Christmas Day. He became a man. In order for him to have become a man, he had to leave the portals of heaven. He had to leave the beauty the perfection, the holiness, the godliness, the glory of heaven, the presence of God, the triune God. He had to leave that and come to this earth, the sinful place where there's death, where there's imperfection, where there's murder, where there's sickness, where there's dying, where there's rotting, where there's wars. He had to come, the opposite of this, to come down to become a man in order to save this world. You see, he, God, realized that there was only one that can save this God-forsaken world. And it was Jesus. Remember, God destroyed the whole earth once before. Can you remember? Anybody know? Shout out. The flood. The flood. He only saved Noah and his family. And then after the flood and they came out... God says, never again will I destroy them. And he did what? He gave a rainbow as a covenant. So Jesus had to leave all that perfection, come down to the earth to become a man. His God is king of kings. Now, what is significant about king of kings? I've never met the queen. But people, you watch it on TV and you see when you meet the queen, you, you do your things, right? You bow before the queen and the kings in other countries of reverence. And there are people that serve them. There are people that provide for them. Jesus was king. But listen to what he says. I am the king of kings, but I've come here. You don't have to serve me. Because again, the way the world sees greatness, oh, the queen is great, the king is great. The way God sees greatness is the complete opposite. This is what God is saying. 
in the presence of a king, of an earthly king, the greatest person, you will find this in the book of Luke as well, the greatest person there is not the king, but the servant. Someone once said, the president can disappear, the country will continue on. The boss can disappear, the company will carry on. The pastor can disappear, the church will carry on. But if the cleaner leaves the job, everybody's falling all over themselves. It was on the news in this week as well about schools where one of these men made the point. A teacher's off sick, they get a cup of teacher and the work goes on. Principal is off sick, the, the school carries on. The cleaner doesn't turn up or the cleaner doesn't turn up, you will soon notice. Amen? Folks, what am I saying this morning? Let me say it this way. The greatest in the school is the cleaner. Sorry, teachers. My wife is a teacher, sorry. I come back to verse 45, I'm going to close. Just, just a couple of more moments. It's, Jesus says, I came to, not to be served. I am the king, don't serve me. And this is what he says, but to serve but to serve. You sometimes see, especially over Christmas New Year, the President of the United States, it's, it's a custom for them. They would go and serve uh, meals to the army. So he would stand behind and they would dish up and serve those men and women that serve the country. I think the Prime Minister's year have done it once or twice, but it's not a custom. I don't know. I haven't done the research on it, but you rarely see a king or a queen go out and serve people. Do you? Maybe. Yeah, Jesus, your king, your king, our king, my king, said, I don't want you to serve. I'm not here to serve, to be served. I come here to serve with you. And how did he serve? He showed them. What did he do in the upper room? Can you remember? He did one thing. There you go. He took water, basin. He went down, bent down, and he washed the feet of the disciples. You will read also in scripture how one of them said, Lord, you will not wash my feet. Who was it? You know, one of the disciples said it, that's homework for you. But Jesus was teaching them how to be a servant, how to be humble. Folks, this morning, as we start the series on servanthood, will you today take up your mop and follow him? Take up your mop and follow him. There's so many ways that we can serve. And like I said, in the coming weeks, we will look at what it means to be a servant of God. This was basically an introduction this morning. But Jesus says, he came not to be served, but to serve. We are not greater than Jesus. We should not be afraid to serve. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you this morning, O oh God, for knowing you as our Savior. Thank you for new here. As we look ahead, we want to first and foremost serve you. Lord, then we want to serve each other. We want to serve our brothers and sisters in our church. The word of God says, therefore do good to all men, especially to the household of faith. And so we want to serve each other. And you will show us how to serve each other. How to walk with each other. And Lord, help us to also serve our community. As the word of God says, 
that go and make disciples of all nations. Nations. Ethnos. Different people groups. So this year as we go, we just want to serve. So will you speak to each and every one of us? But more so individually. That we ask ourselves, how do I serve this year? How do I serve you this year? How do I serve my church this year? And how do I serve my community, my family? Lord, I pray that this year we will not be afraid of the word servant, of the word slave. Because your word says to be great, be a servant. Father, help us uh, to think about it more this coming week and make us excited of the great possibilities of being, all of us, servants. Servant united. Oh God, come be blessed. And we ask it in Jesus Christ's name for thanksgiving. Amen. 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 I'll ask the worship team to come up as we come and worship the Lord. Can we rise to sing our final song? To God be the glory, great things he has done. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So love be the world that he gave us his son. Who yield, gave his life and atonement for sin. And open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord.
the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the great things that you have done in our lives and all the great things that you will be doing over the coming days, weeks, and years. Lord, help us to recognize your hands at work within our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And to close, let's just say the grace to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen. Grave to the sky, Lord, I live.